some men brought their friend to Jesus. And, and literally, they carried him to Jesus. It wasn't because he was unwilling to go and see the Savior, but it was because he was paralyzed, couldn't walk. Unfortunately, there were so many people crowding around Jesus in the home where he was teaching that these men couldn't get their friend to the Savior. Undeterred, they climbed up onto the roof of the house, and piece by piece, they started to tear apart that roof. Imagine that. Grown men actually tearing apart a hole so that their friend could see Jesus. Then when they had a large enough hole in the roof, they lowered their friend down on his mat. People inside of the house who were already kind of crowded together to begin with, they had to cram together even more to make sure that mat didn't come down on them. Jesus sees the whole scene unfold. And as he begins to talk to that paralyzed man, he starts out by saying, Take heart, my son. And right there, I'd like you to, like you to stop and forget about the rest of that Bible account. For just a moment, I'd like you to, to forget the fact that we read it earlier from the Gospel lesson. Don't sneak a peek at it in your bulletins. Don't think about the sermon theme. Forget everything that comes after that. And imagine, what would you expect Jesus to say? That's maybe a little hard to ask you to ignore everything you know about the rest of the story. So let me help you out a little bit. For a moment, think about your own life. And think about a time in your life where you maybe faced a problem. Or think about somebody else you know when they faced a problem. Someone that was close to you. Perhaps the, the problem you're thinking about was a diagnosis of something like cancer. Maybe you're thinking about some accident that, that threw life into to, to topsy-turvy mode. Perhaps the problem that you're thinking of is one that, that still you carry with you. Perhaps the pain and sadness of some loss. Or maybe the weight of depression from, from not feeling good enough for one reason or another. Whatever the problem. Didn't you pray about it as a Christian? How many times did you pray about it? Did you ask God to, to get rid of that problem? Did you get maybe a little frustrated or upset or even scared when God didn't take that problem away as quickly as, as you thought? As you think about that, consider what, what would you expect Jesus to say to that man lying on that mat. His friends had brought him to see the Son of Man, the man who had healed so many others before. This man's problem was obvious. All you had to do was look at the fact that he was lying on a mat and had to be carried around, and you knew he was paralyzed. We might expect Jesus to say to someone like that, Take heart, my son. Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Maybe we would expect Jesus to say, Take heart, my son. I'm going to take away your paralysis. Take heart, my son. I'm going to give you the use of your legs. But no. No, Jesus, he seems to, to swing and miss when it comes to this problem, doesn't he? This obvious problem that's staring him right in the face, he seems to miss it. He says to this man, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. No healing. No relief from having to be carried around by others. No end to being dependent on others and having to beg for the needs of life. All that Jesus offers this man to encourage him is the forgiveness of sins. Sitting here tonight, we maybe think to ourselves, oh, that should be enough, right? I mean, this is Jesus. He's, he's telling the man his sins are forgiven. Of course that should be enough. It's easy for us to think that when someone else is lying on the mat, looking up at Jesus with pleading eyes. But what about when I'm the one on the mat? What about when you're the one 
who is looking up at Jesus with pleading eyes because of a problem. Don't we want more? Don't we want to know why has this problem happened to me? Or, or how long is this problem going to last, Lord? Maybe we even want just, just a little bit of relief, or probably, if the truth were told, we want more than just a little bit of relief. We want the whole problem to be gone. Maybe when you've dealt with a problem, it's really bothered you. Have you ever come to church and maybe hoped that, that something you heard in one of the lessons or in the sermon or somewhere in the service would speak specifically to your situation? But all you found was, was one message repeated again and again. I'm going to paraphrase that message. You're forgiven. Have you ever gone to the Lord's Supper? And you hope that maybe you'd, you'd leave the Lord's table with at least a little bit of a feeling of joy in your heart, a little bit of a feeling of relief. But, but you got up to the Lord's table and all that was there was that same little wafer of bread and that little tiny sip of wine. And your pastor who just simply said to you, given for you for the forgiveness of sins. How often in the midst of life's problems doesn't it seem like all God gives us to encourage us is the forgiveness of sins? It's kind of ironic. The people in this gospel account who, who most quickly and readily recognized the divine power of Jesus' words to that paralyzed man were the very same people who denied the power of Jesus' words. We're told that there were some scribes who were watching this scene unfold, and as they looked at, at what Jesus said and what was happening, they accused Jesus of blasphemy. What that means is that they recognized the words Jesus spoke as words that only God can speak. They thought to themselves, only God can announce forgiveness. Only God has the right to give that kind of comfort. And they looked at that very human-looking Jesus who stood in front of them, and they said, he can't do that. He doesn't have the right. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the authority to be able to give that kind of comfort to people. But Jesus, what a Savior, he doesn't let his forgiveness get called into question. And so he spoke some other words, some other divine words to that paralyzed man, words that only God can speak. He said to him, pick up, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Only God can say that with the result that we read in our text. He rose and went home. When Jesus said, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. He was speaking words that required no, no less the power of God than those words telling that man to get up and walk. In fact, to announce that forgiveness, that takes even more of God's power and grace. We should never underestimate the power of those words. And those words, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, they always fit. Even in those times when when those words, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, don't seem to match the problem that, that we're facing or the specific circumstances of, of our lives. They do fit. They do apply. Those words, they bring comfort, don't they? I mean, what comfort is there when you're sick and having that great physician stand at your bedside and say, take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. When you're buried under the weight of depression, what relief there is in that source of all joy our Savior saying to you, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. When life brings an accident that turns your life upside down or inside out, what stability in that rock of our salvation, saying to you, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Those words, more than any other, tell us that God's attitude of love has not changed. Those words, more than any other, they make it clear that that, that problem in life you're dealing with, it doesn't change the way that God views you. It doesn't change the way that that he feels towards you. It doesn't change the relationship he has built for you through Jesus Christ. Those words communicate. They communicate that you still do have a home and a hope and
and a future in heaven. See, those words, they may not seem like they're targeted to those obvious problems of life that we see with our eyes. That's because they're targeted to the real problem of life that's behind every one of those obvious problems. They're targeted towards that problem of sin. You see, Jesus doesn't say, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, because he's blind to the, the problems in our lives that stare him in the face. He says, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, because he sees the real problem that's standing before him. He sees us as we really are. He sees us as sinners who need forgiveness. And so we dare never underestimate the divine power of those words, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And we shouldn't miss their power, even though God takes those words and he puts them into, into the mouths of human messengers. The people who were there in that house who saw this scene unfold we're told at the end of the lesson that they glorified God who had given such authority to men. They saw that very, that very human-looking Jesus standing before them. And yet they recognized that the words he spoke really were God's words. And that's the way that our Savior Jesus still deals with us today. He hides his divine power by taking his divine words and giving them to human messengers. And just think a little bit earlier in this service. Who is it that you saw standing before you announce the forgiveness of sins? You saw me, right? Just a man. Just like you. In fact, I'm not even that impressive of a man to look at. And yet, what I said to you was God's word. I announce that forgiveness by the call and by the authority of Christ Jesus. I didn't tell you your sins were forgiven because I thought that would be a nice thing to say to you tonight. I said that because that's what God has commanded to be said to repentant sinners. And you know what? That same forgiveness, it's as valid when you say it to each other in your own homes. It's as valid and certain as if Christ Jesus was dealing with you himself. A small sip of wine and a tiny wafer of bread, they may not stir your emotions. But that body and blood of Jesus that's given for you, that communicates that powerful message, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. The weakness and frailty of the messengers and the means that God uses don't in any way diminish the power of that forgiveness that God communicates to us. Some men brought their friend to Jesus. Literally, they, they carried him to the Savior. Not because he was unwilling to go, but because he was paralyzed. Unfortunately, there were so many people crowded around that house, around Jesus as he taught, that these men could not get their friend in to see the Savior. Undeterred, they climbed up to the roof of the house, and piece by piece, they started to tear off the roof of that house. Imagine that, grown men tearing apart a hole so that their friend could see the Savior. Then when they had a hole big enough, they lowered their friend down on his mat. People inside of that house already crammed together. They, they smushed together even more so that that mat doesn't come down on them. Jesus sees the whole scene unfold as he opens his mouth to speak to that paralyzed man. What do you expect him to say? What should Jesus say to that paralyzed man? He says the one thing that that man on that mat needed to hear. He says the one thing that you and I need to hear when we are the ones on that Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.
We'll continue by confessing our faith with Christians globally using the words of the Apostles' Creed. They're found on page 41 in front of the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. 